Welcome to The Laws of Style, featuring conversations on creativity, fashion, and the law from the leading edge of our economy and culture. Hosted by noted fashion lawyer, Douglas Hand. Hello, and welcome to the podcast, The Laws of Style. Downloading to you from New York City, I'm your host, Douglas Hand. Today, we have the author of Retail Pride, a retail guru, and a fellow board member on Goodwill with me, Ron Thurston. Ron, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much, Douglas. You, of course, are a fashion industry vet veteran. I mean, really, really, your entire career has been centered around retail and fashion. How did you get your start in the industry? So I, um, it's, it's almost as if I were destined to be in it, to be honest, because I grew up in, um, in South Lake Tahoe, Northern California, on the California side. And my grandfather was the CEO of a large construction company that built grocery stores and um, employed nearly everyone in my family worked in construction. But my grandfather, my grandmother owned a fabric store. And my mom was also very um, sk highly skilled seamstress tailor herself, still is today. I mean, she's, um, I, I, she teaches quilting of quality of which I have never seen before. She's an incredibly skilled seamstress. Um, and so here I am trying to balance between like, do I want to go into construction? Do I want to go into fashion? And just the kind of older, the older I got, I'm like, I want to work somewhere in the industry and in fashion. I just don't know doing what. So I actually went to Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising in, in San Francisco and subsequently in LA and got a degree in fashion design and a degree in retail administration and said, I don't really know what I'm going to do, but it's going to be in this, this industry somehow. And within that industry, you know, kind of getting a broad education so that you had optionality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's exactly what it was. Well, and so you, you kind of found your niche um, really in retail, and you've been recognized mm -hmm. as one of the top 100 retail influencers, um, and you're the founder of Take Pride Today. Can you tell us about that? That's your consulting platform, but I know there's a lot behind that that's also re related to the book. So yeah. how about you just play jazz on that? Sure. Uh, so Take Pride Today is the kind of overarching um, platform that I'm kind of using to think about how we continue to have important conversations about how we show up, how we take pride in um, how we act, the conversations we have, um, how we, maybe how we dress, you know, the, every aspect of our life, you say, what today am I going to take pride in? And it's, it's a, it's an old conversation, but it's a new conversation in a way. And so my, the title of my book being Retail Pride, using that word was quite intentional. You know, and a, as a gay man, the word pride has its own associations. And the idea of um, this is not about gay pride, this is about pride. And so you could use that word in many different contexts. But I like this idea of, Today, as an action, I'm going to take pride in X and you insert whatever that is for you on that particular day. So I wanted to take what foundationally has been my book, build on a platform of speaking engagements and, and probably future, a future book, um, another one around kind of this topic, because it's a really important one when you think about not just in retail, but in, in every part of your life, you know, it's really, you know, I kind of, I say like what happens when you show up with pride, you know, everything, everything changes. And as a leader, you know, as someone who has spent my career leading leaders, that idea of when you're really proud as a leader, your team knows it and your team inherently kind of rises to the challenge. If you say, I'm really proud to work here, I'm really proud to sell represent this brand to be the best version of myself, people follow those, I believe, that have that point of view. And I wanna just every day talk about how are you going to show up with pride today in what you do? 
And so that's, that's been my platform the last couple of months and will continue to grow over time. That's interesting. You know, I mean, pride, there, there's, there's a notion of actualization, I think, in pride, particularly when you're talking about where you are working, because mm -hmm. thankfully, where we work is a choice. And if you are proud of that place of work, then you are confident that you made the right choice and you feel very aligned with the organization. You know, in, in the laws of style, one of the things I talk about that makes people the most effective and look the best is when they are confident. Is that kind of part of the thread of, of the thrust of, of retail pride? You know, it, it is. And you know, if I think about like confidence is, is influenced by, by your pride. And so like say, if I'm really proud to work here, I'm confident in what I'm selling, I'm confident in what I'm doing, it all merges together. And I, I do believe it's, um, and, and pride as it relates to the retail industry has been something that's really important and has you know, been nearly a year since my book came out. The same, every day I receive messages from someone of like thanking me for having a conversation or changing the language about what it means to work in retail. Because while it's the biggest, private sector employer in this country, it's not a career that's always one that is deemed you know, esteemed. And you know, it can be a backup choice or, well, if you couldn't do anything else, you work in retail. If you, you know, didn't have an education, you work in retail. And I wanted to say, actually, I can be a confident, proud leader, no matter the price point, which I think is an, an important part of this conversation is that your pride in the company you work for and what you sell should not be dictated by price. And that's what I, I love these conversations of someone that comes to me that works at the dollar store or you know, someone that works in luxury who are equally proud of what they do. And that's, um, that's really em empowering and talk about building confidence. Yeah. yeah. Well, you have a really broad background in terms of of that stratification of price points, you know, from, from luxury at Saint Laurent, and, and I would say, you know, intermix as well, uh, to kind of ready to wear at, at Tory Burch, um, and, and also at Bonobos, which I would say is, is relatively mass. I mean, certainly now since yeah. it was acquired. Um, explain how, you know, so I get at Saint Laurent when you walk in and you're wearing Saint Laurent and you're selling it, that you can feel pretty elevated. That's what the brand does. How do you feel elevated selling at Bonobos? You know, how did you galvanize your troops to feel like, hey man, our pants are the pants <laughs> and you are the cat's meow for selling these pants. How, how do you do it? It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's fascinating because I actually grew up at the Gap. My first 10 years of my career were at Gap. And I was really proud to work there. I was actually at Gap Kids is where I started when they were run as separate companies. Okay. And I quickly discovered that service and the experience that you want to deliver and the kind of the pride in what you do um, can happen no matter what you're selling. So here I am launching Baby Gap. I know nothing about baby clothes, but what I really figured out is that most of the people that would come in are looking for a gift and also have no idea what they're doing. And if the level of service is at its peak, then your likelihood to close the sale and to convert and probably have the biggest sale is based on your knowledge of, of what it is that you're doing. And so as my career has progressed, you know, Bonobos is a really good example because the guide shop model that we built is about a one-on-one -on -one service experience entirely rooted and fit. And so if you say the best here, the chinos come in 16 different colors and four different fits. And most men that as I was you know, opening stores and doing press and meeting customers and training, I trained literally every single person early on about how to sell was most men have no idea how their clothes should fit. And their almost lack of confidence is instilled because of their lack of, of knowledge about like 
about fit and style. And, you know, funny enough, it seemed as though a lot of men's like wives, girlfriends, moms were buying their clothes for them. So I would take this approach of like, I'm actually going to teach you how your clothes should fit during this. It's not about selling you anything. I don't want your mom's opinion. I'm going to teach you how your clothes should fit. And it hundred percent of the time will end up in a sale if you take that approach. But more than anything, he felt more confident of like, oh, I think I could do this on my own. Yeah. And then, or the second, or the let's talk about shirt. Let's talk about suiting. Let's talk about fabric. Let's, I'm going to teach you some things that you, that you've never heard before. And that whether you're selling chinos or selling this leather jacket at Saint Laurent or selling, you know, a cocktail dress at Intermix, the idea of I'm going to actually teach you some things about fashion history, about fit, about style, about, well, actually what time is this cocktail event? And so like every, every aspect, I think you have the opportunity in retail to make um, an impression that is really unforgettable. Again, I take price out of the equation because $80 chinos can be found anywhere. But does someone actually teach you why this particular brand is important and how it should fit? It's, I, I find it pretty rare. Yeah, yeah. Well, and fit, <laughs> particularly, we'll say the American man. I guess, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and maybe I, I think there's a question in here that, I, that I'd like to ask. I mean, so what is it about men that are raised in other cultures? I won't point necessarily to just the Italians, you know, mm -hmm. um, but why do they seem to get it so much better than we do here in the U.S.? In my impression, this is entirely in my opinion, it feels very generational. It feels as though you know, Italian men seems to have really well-dressed Italian fathers or grandfathers, and that there's almost this kind of passing down of knowledge and wisdom about fit and fabric and designer and styling, because it never seemed about, about it never feels about quantity of ownership of your closet. It feels like the right pieces. Yeah. And I'd love to, you know, when you're in Rome and you see, really, you know, older, really well-dressed men who probably have really well-dressed children. Yeah. And, yeah. I, you know, you don't see that in the U.S. Yeah. And probably don't have walk-in closets that have 80 different options. Uh, right. You know, and, and so, right. you know, hence the, the attention to that quality as well. Well, right. uh, Pulling out and just looking at retail maybe more broadly, I mean, before the pandemic, which is now a couple of years in our rear view, but still, still with us, um, but even before the pandemic, the retail industry in particular was, was in pretty, pretty bad shape. Uh, and the pandemic obviously took down some, some, some leaky ships in, yeah. you know, obviously Barney's and, you know, I, I won't name the list. The list you and I both know is quite long. Mm -hmm. um, are there any sort of green sprouts? You know, is this a moment where the industry can recreate itself for the better? You know, and, the, and those leaky ships would have sunk regardless. And I think everyone's aware that this the conversation has been overdone about how things have sped up. Um, but I love this time in the industry and retail for exactly what the best version of retail is, which is a highly curated um, kind of assortment because what's important is that the web e-commerce gives us access to hundreds of thousands of SKUs at any given moment. I wanna see the best version of what you've chosen, what you think is important, what I need to know when I walk into your store. And so like the idea of a highly curated assortment with an exceptional team who you remember, who you have engaged, who've taught you something, kind of what we've been talking about this morning. Mm -hmm. That is the best version of retail. That's how retail started. And that's, it is about kind of an education, about immersion, about community, about follow-up. You know, it's not about the one-time purchase. Leave all of that to e-commerce and say, 
when you're ready to learn more about my brand and engage, come into the store. And if you just need to, you know, Bonobos is a good example. Once maybe I had that understanding of how my Chino should fit, can I just order them on the website? Definitely. Yeah. But then when you need a suit, when you need a shirt, when you need a polo, come in and see us and we'll teach you again how that particular product should fit and then order it in six colors on the website. And so for, for the unanointed um, in the various now points of communication that you can have, what, what does that look like now for the retail employee in terms of engagement with the customer? Obviously coming into the store, but outside of that, what are the other touch points? So there's certainly kind of this, you know, kind of a lack of, lack of channel engagement. So you say every customer expects that you have a, a strong brick and mortar retail business and a strong social media business and a strong e-commerce business and probably some other like wholesale accounts. So what is interesting is the customer's expectation post COVID has said, I expect people in stores to have access and knowledge of where the product sits in their hand. So this idea of, well, do you have that in, beautiful blazer in stock. Well, we might, I'm not sure. Let me, let me go downstairs. Let me call another store. Let me look on the website. The customer has no patience for that. That said, actually, yes, it's available, you know, only on our e-commerce site. And here it is on my phone, on an iPad, let me show you. And so if you, if you're asking the customer to do more work after they've already shown up in your building, then you've, lo you've lost them already. And so the minute you and I would meet in a store and you had questions, I should be able to tell you exactly what's going to happen within these four walls and what happens in other social channels. And that's, talk about building pride. You know, when someone's really that enabled, technology-based, you know, so I talk a lot about kind of being human-centric and technology-enabled in retail, because you no one's going to store all that knowledge in their head. But if I have something in my hand, if I have access to information that makes the experience better, you should know at all times where all the inventory sits for the company, how fast can I get it, and, and kind of what's the, next, what's the next step in the journey. Yeah. And that's the, that's the fun part of retail. Well, has this um, created any issues for really tracking credit for the sale. And by that, I mean, I mean, all retail employees mm -hmm. will know what I mean. Uh, many have a component of compensation that's based on commission and based on number of sales and amount of sales. Yeah. You know, how, how, do, how do brands now track that when I might spend 45 minutes with you, get a full education on chinos or tailored clothing or ties, um, probably not ties these days, but, uh, <laughs> and, uh, then I may go online and buy it. And I may have never given you any, any way to track me. Yeah. And that's where, so there are a couple of different answers to that. Some um, kind of use cookie and like backend technology to say, well, actually, if you looked at it via a link I sent you, so we're texting and you say, hey, Douglas, like I just got in these great new ties. I want to show them to you. I text them to you. Then you can, and, through where you click to look at them online, I know that it came via my outreach. So there are ways to tag it on the back end, mm -hmm. but I also think, you know, the overall compensation structure of how we've built entry price point versus contemporary versus luxury, at this point feels really outdated. And we have to rethink this because this idea of, I get commission for what I sell, or these are my clients or, you know, they've shopped within a certain radius of the store um, or, you know, it's a New York client that has a home in Palm Beach, but she shops in Palm Beach when she's there and she shops in the Upper East Side when she's home. Who gets the, who gets the sale? It, it's, it becomes really outdated. And as e-commerce grows and you think about how we compensate our teams, we have to actually think differently about this. It's not sustainable for the future because this isn't going backwards. This is not COVID related. This was already happening. Yeah. And now we have to actually rethink our business models. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's, 
for the consumer potentially, it's a little scary. The the you know because one solution is just they take your picture when you go in, and then they face identify, and all of a sudden, okay, that person talked to Ron because we have yeah. digital evidence of it, and then four hours later they ordered online. Credit to Ron, um, which is a little scary, but but you know is is certainly one pathway to to giving that credit. Yeah. Um, pivoting a little bit. Yep. Unless you have more on that. I you know, I, I would just say, I think we, we in this industry are all in service to the customer. And no matter what that looks like from a social, from a brick and mortar retail to e-commerce, to clientele and outreach, to technology you know, enabled businesses, the customer has to feel at the top of of the chain and everything that we do should feel like it's in service. And the minute that a customer feels uncomfortable of like, oh, I, you know, I normally shop with Douglas, today I'm shopping with someone else, I feel guilty about that. I'm gonna take a return to a different store because I don't want them to see me. You know, every moment that you put pressure on a customer to do something that they're uncomfortable doing or wasn't effortless and seamless, you run the risk of a leaky bucket of customer of a CRM database. And so the whole game is about acquisition and retention. And there's no shortage of brands. And so if the way that you retain is through seamless customer experiences in every touch point. And that we have built, we have put into place for years, systems and, and policies that are actually not always customer friendly. And I think it's, I think it's time to change so much of this. Yeah. Well, to the pivot, uh, mm -hmm. as I mentioned, <laughs> you and I are, um, we know each other from goodwill. And I would, um, I would say that we're, we're among the more active board members, uh, but, yeah. but it is an active board. Uh, and it's an organization that uh, personally drew me because the mission uh, of, of helping those that have challenges uh, obtaining gainful employment um, and, and increasing their confidence through the power of work uh, is, is served by what I feel is another mission, um, another positive mission, which is selling secondhand goods and, and candidly keeping a lot of apparel and accessories out of landfills. Um, why did you join and you know how, how You've helped tremendously, but I'll ask the question, how have you helped? Uh, so I have helped because when I wanted to kind of find board opportunities, my expertise in retail is where I wanted to add value. So Goodwill was at the top of the list and say, this is inherently a retail business, that their, their success or failure is only built on how how donations, whatever's dropped off and how well the store is run. And if I knew that I could help somehow in supporting a successful retail business, that is um, it's a highly engaged teams and leadership teams and whatever help, advice, support I could give, I knew would improve how the retail operations of things, therefore the revenue that's generated to do all of their good work. And there are very few retail-based nonprofits. You know, that's, that, that's not normally the, the operating model. And so they were, they were at the top. And um, during my tenure at, at Intermix owned by Gap Inc., Gap Inc. has a huge Gap Foundation you know, that then helps place senior executives into boards. And they were, they were very generous with me. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a great time, I think, for Goodwill and Salvation Army and others that, uh, that are engaged in this, this method because I think the consumer is ready for that secondhand experience. Um, and I, I think personally, uh, people that can pick through donated goods uh, and come out with an outfit that is stylish are you know, 10 out of 10, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a high style bar to hit and a very responsible one. Um, 
Do you think that brands, particularly those brands that are now moving into a second hand economy for their own items, uh, do you think that that is the future or will there be mass brands that are still really kind of based on the, the cycle of seasons pushing more and more goods? Mm. I think that every brand has to have this conversation today because the customer expects it. Again, if, we're, if everything we do is with the intention of serving our customer and listening to our customer, the customer is saying, we actually don't wanna buy more. We wanna buy the right pieces and maybe potentially even pay more for them, but I want them to be you know, done in a sustainable way you know, with companies that are doing good work. And if that means uh, that you also have a process for me to return product and get credit for it to get new and that there's a kind of trade work being done um, or there's a rental program, you know, all of that has to play into the customers having this conversation on their own. And it's our responsibility to then lean into that, not say, well, that's not for us. That's not our brand model actually is what is the customer saying and how can we serve them? And if that means that we have a trade-in program or we have a whole part of our business that is just about um, kind of sustainability, that that's a, great, that's a great thing to do today because that's what everyone's talking about. From your perspective, who, some of the brands that, that are engaging in, whether it's this conversation about sustainability or supply chain integrity, or other conversations that that consumers are that is top of mind for them. What what are some brands that from from your perspective do that best? Hmm. I mean, I've always admired Eileen Fisher, you know, and I remember even seeing you know this, um, you know how it how the fabric first being female led. You know, I I think we all have to think first of you know brands that are have embraced female-led organizations. It's one of the reasons why I worked for Tory Burch for so many years. And this idea of, you know, foundationally, Tory started her brand to start a foundation to empower female-owned businesses. So I think of, you know, Eileen Fisher, female-led and founded, also very rooted in culture and people, because I know people who worked both in the retail side and the corporate side who, I mean, talk about pride really proud to work for that brand. They know very clearly who their customer is. And on top of that, you know, have opportunities for um, buying upcycled and you know, a recycled product in the store. So that, you know, that one kind of comes to mind, but, you know, I think of, you know, brands that have had rental programs now. So instead of disposing product, like I, I am in the rental program for Scotch and Soda, you know, it was probably never my favorite brand, to be honest, it's a, it airs on the kind of the wacky side for me, where I'm a little more classic, but I'm like, you know what? I like this idea of like, I'm going to try things. If I don't like them, it's a constant, I receive a bag of things, hundred percent of it goes back sometimes, but I like the idea of, um, instead of this being disposed of or marked down or thrown out, let's find new business models. And so this kind of, everyone's I won't say everyone. I think brands that are doing this with intention around not just being another brand with more clothes um, is is where their head should be. And this this folds nicely right into a question, which is regarding you know work from home dress and the fact that while people are now going back into the office, they may not be going five, seven days a week, you know, maybe a couple of yeah. days a week. Um, but they are bringing with them some ideas and, and thoughts and styles that they were wearing at home. Um, so where do you see the, the opportunity there for brands? Um, yeah. and, and, and how have you perhaps changed, you know, how, how you present yourself? Yeah. So I, um, I live in downtown Manhattan, as you can see from World Trade behind me. And it's funny because as, as the men have come back to work downtown here, you know, I've been trying to like, I've observed them in like bin packs as I usually travel for lunch. 
And you know, the kind of blue shirt chino thing has definitely not changed. There's yeah. a lot of like polos and it's also the summer, polos, blue shirt, chinos um, hasn't changed. So I, what I haven't seen are men more seriously dressed and suiting. I have not seen that on the street. I've seen that uptown in some meetings I've been in, but not, not downtown yet. Uh, it, it's a, my own wardrobe has definitely evolved. I'm, I'm definitely wearing fewer blazers mm -hmm. and such, and probably more knits than I used to. Um, and it, yeah, I, it is definitely the idea of the type drawstring pants, which is, you know, I love my personal style could be like blazer, knit, drawstring pant. I do love that, that look. Yeah. Uh, like easier, a little easier to wear um, than kind of a, a formal pant or a suit. I, I don't wear a lot of, a lot of suiting. Mm -hmm. Well, but it's still mm -hmm. tidy, I think, you know, yes. it's still, it, it gives one a waste yes. <laughs> in a way that, that, that sweats, if we just call them sweats, don't typically. Um, yes. You know, sweats evolved in a positive way. They've, they've gotten tapered. I mean, you know, you get a pair of sweats today. It does not look like the champion sweats that, that perhaps you and I grew up in that yep. puddle at your feet and, you know, um, you know, they're, they're pretty nicely fitting, but you can still tell sweats relative to actual trousers. And can, yeah, I would can. say sweats are a no-no, uh, at least in a law office or an investment bank. Um, but, but things are definitely shifting and evolving in that way. Yeah. That kind of technology fabric that's been so prevalent now in men's pants. Yeah. Um, I think that that's become the new, the kind of the new fabric of, of the pant. Yeah, and more and more brands keep just growing this technology fabric, um, which in three, four years ago was not a thing. Yeah, yeah I golf think course. it kind of moved yeah. from the golf course really into the boardroom. <laughs> and it's not much of a move when you consider, you know, a lot of golfers are, are, are service professionals. Another interesting development has been sort of the, the evolution of brands that don't position their products as necessarily for men or women. You can call them unisex brands. You can call them, you know, sort of sex ag agnostic. There are a lot of different terms for them. Um, but I, I find that very interesting as someone who has often shopped the women's racks of certain designers because I just have found those options to be a little bit more exciting and not that I'm a peacock or anything, but you know, sometimes they just, there's more interesting yeah. things on that rack. What, what do you think of that as a business model? You know, are you seeing that grow? Yeah, I, my sense is that, you know, it's not, it's not going to dominate in the industry by any stretch. What I think is important though, is that, you know, similar to the idea of how we, identify our, our preferred pronouns and gender, you know, so, you know, my name is Ron, my, my preferred pronouns are he, him, his. It's not that there's question about my, how I identify my gender generally, but, but it, what it does is it opens a space for people who don't always have a voice. And so if that becomes the norm and say, this is my preferred pronoun, someone who has, um, not been able to identify their preferred pronoun, all of a sudden sees a space to do that. And, and that's why I'm such an advocate of this. You can identify your gender, your pronoun, however you choose to, because there are now fashion companies and, and every, every time we have the opportunity to identify ourselves how we prefer, it's not for me it's for everyone else that maybe doesn't have that opportunity somewhere else in the world, somewhere else in this country. And, you know, we do live in a, in a bubble here in New York city and, you know, spending you and I both spent time at fashion week this week, you know, a lot of men in dresses and a lot of kind of gender fluid clothing. But if you drop that somewhere else in this country it would not be well received. And I think we also have to recognize that fact that it feels great and it's fun and we embrace it here, but we don't always embrace that as a, as a country or as a world. Yeah. And every step that says, you know, I, I, I have this in my head because I was reading the review this morning for Chromat, who has been, you know, traditionally 
you know, pretty wild on the end. Mm -hmm. And you know, she said she wanted to create a collection for women who don't tuck. And I was like, wow, I've never heard someone say that before. And you know, it's like, bravo to you. Like, I really admire her that would just go out and say that. And you know, it was very kind of community-based clothing. And so this, you know, I love what brands are doing just because someone somewhere that's not in New York City sees that and says, I can be me. I can feel a little bit more like myself. There are parts of the world that if I were there would embrace me. Yeah. And that, while, do I think it's a huge business model? No, but is it important as a human race and as a culture? It's hugely important. I've always loved living in a big urban center because, you know, the, 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 the loss is our gain. Those people who don't mm -hmm. feel that they fit in in certain communities that are more conservative come to us and, and they right. make our lives so much richer, uh, our experiences so much richer, and certainly this city, um, a yeah. great place to be, a very energizing place to be. Um, well, speaking of, of energizing and, um, and brands, collaborations have always been a thing, but the pace with which we're seeing collaborations happen has, I think, sped up quite a bit. Um, what, do, what do you think of that for brands? Um, and how does it impact retail? Is it a source of pride? Uh, or can it be a source of confusion if you've aligned yourself as an employee with a brand and then they do kind of a somewhat wacky mm. collab. Oh, I think it, it really goes back to this conversation around client acquisition and retention. And so a collaboration's intent is to acquire customers. Mm -hmm. And so this idea of two really important brands, Balenciaga and Gucci, you know, under the same you know, house or, or parent company, but like what ha happened there from a client acquisition standpoint, I have friends that work in both of those brands is enormous. And so like, but it doesn't have to just be powerhouse luxury brands you know, that every retailers having collaborations, we did several at Intermix, kind of our own kind of versions of what collaborating with certain brands would look like because there's a client acquisition intent and a brand awareness. So you're merging potentially in social followings business opportunities, client acquisition, client retention. And it, so it works on both ends. I think it will only get bigger over time. And it may give, it gives a voice sometimes to someone who maybe has a, maybe a smaller business that wants to grow, collaborates with someone you know, with a much bigger voice and it helps elevate you. It helps you acquire more customers. So I actually, it seems as though the, the, the retail side really loves it because it gives you something to speak about and the customer seems to really love it too. Yeah, the, uh, the other thing, the retail side, I think, uh, and the customer acquisition side seems to love is working with influencers. And that's something that uh, perhaps when you started your career didn't exist. I mean, certainly not social media influencers because when we right. both started, there was no such thing as social media. Uh, what do you think of that? that influencer economy and how it impacts fashion? Yeah, I, I think about um, the, the place of authenticity where we are today and that influence um, in a really authentic way is really important. Again, giving voices to people who may not have that opportunity and using influence to say, we have a great partnership. We have something to say. We're going to use people who are important in that segment that we're not speaking to today. And because it opens the door for great conversation. Where I think today's, we still fall in a trap sometimes in fashion is kind of celebrity faces slapped onto brands because it doesn't feel as authentic. You know, Jennifer Lopez for coach and guests just feels really weird to me mm -hmm. like that that's not authentic and so we have to say what feels right for this brand who is actually maybe influential for the existing base but who has something to say that we're not saying today 
Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, the influence that can happen from stores and people who are closest to the customer, you know, at Intermix, every, every individual location all over the country has its own Instagram account filled with the team who works in that store, who really shop in that location for the personal style of that particular person in the store. So they're posting, the customer's following the overarching brand, but also following their favorite people who work in stores who have great style. And they want, they, they want that person to show them how they, they can look. So I think that there's super organic influence that the customer really craves. You know, that is um, maybe not as powerful as a big celebrity name, but I, I think this kind of authentic, easy, um, making powerful statements level of influence is, is where we need to go. Yeah, that, that is interesting. I, I have not heard that. Is that fairly common in your experience with, with either retailers or brands that have their own brick and mortar and therefore their own store staffs, that there are separate yeah. social media accounts or maybe just Instagram accounts, which is you know definitely probably the biggest social media platform that I think fashion yeah. engages with? I think it, it's growing. Um, there's risk associated with it. You, know, you open up the ability for everyone to kind of post at will at tagging your own brand that's not a customer. You have to put some infrastructure in place and we have someone on my team that that was their full-time role just monitoring all of this because mm -hmm. it's, it, it's potentially, you, know, you have some risk. But if you're, again, going to say, I want to serve my customer the best possible way and her favorite people that work in the store have a level of influence, why not make that happen? Why not give, it's actually, it's also a great recruiting opportunity to think about, hey, you come work here, we're gonna allow you to build your own following using us as your platform to gain customers. And like, who doesn't want that today? I will tell you the other like big French houses do not allow this. Mm -hmm. It's a, like, it's a great, it's a great opportunity for someone to come in and say, actually, my goal is to become an independent stylist um, or celebrity stylist or work on in fashion week. How do I make that happen? I build my own following by working in a retail business that lets me do this um, with, with their own product. Yeah. So there's there's oh, a lot of like upside. Talk about pride. I mean, that, that is a great, uh, a great vehicle to, to get to that pride in the brand if they're also taking yeah. pride in, in you. Yep, exactly. Uh, but the risks, for sure. I, we've done a lot of employee <laughs> handbooks and there typically is a section on social media and uh, speaking for the company or yeah. in most cases, not speaking for the company without checking right. communication. So I, I, I fully get it. Um, yeah. You know, to the lawyer, uh, each brick and mortar store is its own little island of potential liabilities, um, is one way to look at it. Also potential opportunities, which is, is yep. also, I think, the right way to look at it. Um, before we run out of time, I would love, you know, any, any anecdotes from your long career in terms of just something crazy that went on in a store, whether it was good or bad, I, I don't, you know, I don't mean to suggest it, it can only be a bad example. Oh, gosh, I mean, we need another hour for all of this. I, um, gosh, you know, I, I have had such a pleasure for working for different kinds of businesses, which was actually pretty intentional on my part. When I figured out that I love service and I love to motivate people, I wanted to find the brands that I knew were also on that same trajectory that would embrace me and say, you know, so when I left Gap and helped start West Elm, same, it was rooted in this idea of service, fast fashion for your home before that was even a thing, mm -hmm. you know, like accessible, smaller footprint, New York based, Brooklyn found, you know, creating accessible luxury and for your home. And, you know, when I left and I ran Apple stores and I said, who has the reputation for company culture that is kind of best in class? And Apple 
does and still to this day have that reputation as a great place to work on the retail side. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to immerse myself in that and learn about it. And you know, I, I actually never thought I would work for a brand like Saint Laurent. I didn't think I was that guy. I was like my entire career working for American brands that have a lot of energy and a lot of drive and a lot of ideas. And here I am running three countries for what I think is still today one of the most important French fashion brands in history. But I rooted myself in, again, learning everything I could about, about him. Mm -hmm. Like, how did he live? Where did he live? Like, where was that first store in 1969 on the left bank? Where was that? And why was it here? And, you know, I had the office, the furniture in my office changed out to everything from 1969. Like I wanted to understand how he was thinking so that every, and so today, every piece that comes down the runway has some influence from him. And if you can share that with the customer, then you always win. Like, and same, like Intermix is a really important place in women's multi-brand luxury fashion. And what I, it's a long answer to your question, but what I would say is we have to be more intentional in our industry about the brands we choose to work for because there are brands doing incredible things and there are some brands that aren't. And if this is a career that you love, choose brands that embrace who you are so that you can thrive under them. And every point in my journey, and certainly there's been a lot of challenges and um, you know, business is great. Sometimes business is terrible, but you get through it and you, um, but it takes a great partnership of really proud people who are well-led and motivated with a great company doing good work. If you put those two things together, you will always win. And I'm confident of that. That's how I've spent the last 30 plus years is exactly that. Great companies with important products, like great product to sell and a great company culture. You can do that, you're gonna win. So did you make the exodus to Marrakesh to, uh, to the museum? I have not, I have not, but, I, but it's definitely something I wanna do. Have you? Uh, I have, and it was, oh. it was actually one of the few museums that was open during the pandemic. Most, mm -hmm. most museums and other um, you know, historical uh, sites were, were closed uh, when my wife and I were there, but uh, it's, yeah. a, it's a glorious, glorious place. Uh, it's, it's mainly used as a platform for many for Instagrammable moments because the color <laughs> scheme in the entire museum is, is, is stunning. But it sounds like you did your diligence and no sort of Emily in Paris moments for you working for um, a great French brand like that. Uh, yeah. Well, Ron, we are out of time, but thank you so, so much thank you. Uh, for joining us. Any, any last parting words? Although I think you, know, you, you wrapped it up nice and tight there at the end with, uh, with some inspiration for us all on the retail side. I mean, do, do as much as the news says that brick and mortar may not be relevant, think about the size and scale of this industry that, you know, 4.4 trillion dollars of revenue generated in this country, 75% of that is in brick and mortar. And so like the minute the news starts to say what I'm doing is not important, go back to the facts. And the facts tell you that what you do is really important and don't get hung up on price point. You can be proud to sell no matter what you do, just embrace it. And that is, I think, a, a new and, and really fun message for a lot of people that work at retail. Well, wise words. And, and thanks again for joining us. Everybody, thanks for tuning in. And we'll see you next time. Bye now. Thank you. You've been listening to The Laws of Style with Douglas Hand. For more information, go to our website at www.hballp.com. And you can also follow us on Instagram and Twitter at, at Hand of the Law. Thank you for tuning in and stay stylish.